Our message tonight is part three of a message called One Another. As we work through this series of the fellowship of the church, this mini-series, just to see what the New Testament teaches about uh, church life and what it should be like. And just by way of review, um, fellowship is coming together as disciples of Jesus. And the church is being the church when it continues in this, when we are focused on one another. This will affect our lives and the lives of others in so many ways. And God is faithful to gather us into this fellowship. And we have a responsibility to respond to the work he's doing in our lives and uh, fellowship with one another. And while it's available to all, not all believers enjoy it. Some don't enjoy it because they're too busy fellowshipping with the world and their eyes are on the world. Some others don't fellowship because they love themselves. They don't want to open their life up uh, to other disciples. Um, we mentioned that fellowship's the currency of the church. And when you choose in fellowship, you invest into somebody else. And frankly, you invest into your own life um, when you invest into somebody else. And fellowship is just that, an investment into another believer. And so how do we make this investment? How do we fellowship? We've been talking about New Testament Christian fellowship and how really it's captured in two words in, in our Bibles, one another. And and I want to remind you of the visual, you know, of that one and one we had before a few or several weeks ago. One person stand and one person stand and one was a different age, uh, a vastly different age than the other. Or we had uh, one and one stand. It was a man and a woman. So there's different genders or, or uh, one man stood and another man stood and they were from different parts of the country and um, with totally different life backgrounds. And as a New Testament church, when we come together together. The one another is everybody toward one another. Uh, doesn't matter your background, doesn't matter who you are. Uh, God brings together all kinds of people um, in fellowship, in the fellowship of the gospel. This is what biblical Christianity is all about. Um, we believe the gospel of Jesus and we love other followers of Jesus. That's how we live the gospel. And so we want to seek to do that more. But the primary one another that Jesus taught is to love one another. And all others stem out of loving one another. Let me just read you. Um, just hold on a minute in there in Romans 14. I want to read you some of the passages we've already covered. And just remind yourselves about these things. Think about them. Romans 12.10 says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. And honor preferring one another. Romans 15, 7 says, Wherefore receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Romans 15, 14 says, We, full of goodness and knowledge, are able also to admonish one another. We're able to help each other, to correct one another, and encourage each other along. Romans 16, 16, we're to greet one another. Now, I'm not going to greet you with an holy kiss, um, okay? I'm going to give you a firm handshake, but the point remains, we are to greet each other and be friendly in that salutation. Ephesians 4, 2, with all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Ephesians 4 tells us to speak the truth in love, for we are members one of another. Ephesians 4 also says, be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Ephesians 5 says we're to sing to one another. Singing is to one another. We'll hit another passage like that where we may tonight. Uh, Ephesians 5 also says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of of God. And you say, well, this kind of sounds a lot like th these could be rules for a family. Get along. You're in a family. Don't make me come back there, right? And you, you would think as a parent, I was praying for my children uh, yesterday or a couple days ago. Um, you know how in the Lord's Prayer, in the model prayer in Matthew uh, 7, I believe, no, Matthew 6, um, Jesus taught his disciples to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And it is reconciliation with others is such a key part of being right with others. Like being in unity, being in harmony is such a key part of the Christian life that and Jesus went on to say that if you don't forgive somebody else, your father won't forgive you. Now, he's not talking about losing salvation. He's not talking about any of that. And we understand that. But you're not going to be right with God if you're not forgiving another. And so my prayer for my children was that, Lord, help us. Because they have good moments, but they have moments they don't get along. And uh, 10 plus hours, 11 plus hours in a vehicle really fleshes that out pretty good. All right? And so it's my prayer that they'll mature to the point that, that they can love each other and have real fellowship 
and that they can learn how to reconcile and they can learn how to speak the truth. That our home would be based on our objectivity, not immaturity, where emotions run high and we can't have an honest conversation and we can't say, well, you hurt me. Uh, no, we can't speak the truth, but I want them to be able to speak the truth to one another and say, hey, let's talk about this. Let's deal with this and be willing to humble themselves and find, uh, make it a win-win situation and find common ground um, to the glory of God and to the less indigestion of their parents. Amen. And, and much in a similar way, a church is called to be like that, a family where we grow to maturity, where we can uh, address things among ourselves and deal with things among ourselves and find solutions and love one another. And the low man wins. Uh, the pre my preacher in college would say, the low man wins. Humble ourselves and be honest and love and admonish and all these things. We, we are lo uh, to be a loving family of disciples who live honestly and lovingly side by side with each other. We lovingly receive each other. We lovingly correct each other. We willingly submit our lives to one another and we're real with each other before our holy God. We're just real. So we'll try to unpack uh, the rest of the one another's this week. And I, I have a stopping spot here So um, uh, tonight and we'll probably finish up next week just for the sake of time. I'm just going to take one passion at a, passage at a time in its context and mix in some negative one another's. Don't do this tonight. But you're in Romans chapter uh, 14. And you remember Romans 14 is a is a major emphasis on the gospel of Jesus Christ and what it means for your life. And we're not going to take the time to unpack all of that, but basically the gospel changes your life and gives you a love, gives you a relationship with God, and you have His love and His Spirit in your life, and it's amazing change, and that should change the way you treat others. Um, it should change your desire that you don't want to be like the world he saved you out of, the world that his wrath is against. You want to be like Jesus. You want to do, you want to prove what is that perfect and acceptable uh, will of God. And what is that? Is that some mystical thing we can never figure out? No, he goes right into explaining to us that he expects us to live as a part of this family, as a part of this body. Um, it, it, to live out love that is real with one another. So he gets to Romans 14. Now, in the church at Rome, just like in, the, in our church here, there were different people from different backgrounds. Now, in, in the church at Rome, you would have had Jews who would have believed the gospel and Gentiles who would have believed the gospel, and they were totally different politically, socially, everything. They were totally different. It's like... It's like in modern America today, say a church planter goes to a town where there's a mix of hard left people and hard right people who can barely even say a nice word to each other. Someone comes and preaches the gospel in that town and say a person, or a person from each of those demographics gets saved and they, they, the guy who's there to plant the church, he's working with them and those individuals get saved and he says, hey, why don't you gather? We're going to have a Bible study in my home uh, on Thursday night. And they go meet in his home and those people who, were, who, who work together and who never have a nice thing to say come to find out two separate occasions um, on two different places. The same guy had talked to them about Jesus and they believed and they both show up on Thursday night. And one, one walks in first, and then the other one walks in um, uh, uh, several minutes later, and he walks in the door, and he sees that guy. Totally different. He's like, Whoa! That's what was happening in the early churches. Totally different backgrounds. But the gospel brought them together. The gospel is what changed their life. The Jews were very religious. They were very, in a sense, conservative. The, the Gentiles would have been very liberal. Kind of do whatever you want. And I'm not trying to force fit it into... I'm just trying to get us to think. Very different, yet go, the gospel brought them together. And so because of that, there were some customs that were non-essential customs. You see, the Christian life is very simple. Believe the gospel, love the saved, and that will change your life. Believe the gospel, love other believers, and, and let God work in your life through His Word to that end. That you would abound in love and, 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 and you would abound and, and be uh, what God wants you to be. But there are some non-essential things that you would imagine two vastly different groups would say, well, this is how this should be, or this is how this should be, and they have all their backgrounds and all those things to unpack. That's what was going on in Romans chapter 14. Look at verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For, and the, the, here's one of those non-essential issues that they sh were struggling with. For one believeth that he may eat all things. 
Another who is weak eateth herbs. In other words, some people believed, I can't eat meat. I've, only, I've got to be a vegan. And they felt like if they ate meat, or this was meat offered to idols, if they ate meat, they would do wrong. But the other believed, hey, I can eat anything. It, what I eat's not going to affect my relationship with God. Okay? And then he says, verse 3, Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. There's different opinions about different things that are not essentials but here's the deal we all answer to jesus look at verse 10 why dost thou judge thy brother why dost thou set it not thy brother for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of christ for it is written as i live saith the lord every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to god so then every one of us shall give account of himself to god we answer to Jesus. There are different opinions on non-essential issues, but we all answer to Jesus. Um, non-essential issues like celebrating Christmas. Some people don't believe in celebrating Christmas. Um, they don't believe it's right to decorate. Some people don't see it as a big deal. They enjoy the festivity of the season because they love Jesus. They think it's a part of uh, believe it just as much just as much of part of celebrating Jesus and the reason for the season um, as, as as anything else and so that's an example another example is and, and this may be a little bit dated but TV or no TV others examples that again may be a little bit dated but theaters or no theaters and there's other things we go things that you might say are not essential issues now you say now now if it's a matter of morality and what's going on you know in certain contexts and i understand that we are called to be holy i get that but sometimes uh in certain churches and in certain circles there is this look down the end of your nose at somebody else and sit on a throne of judgment that only jesus christ has that only jesus christ has and so look what he says. What, what should we do then? Verse 13, look at it. Let us not therefore, here's, our, here's a negative one another, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. In other words, let us not anymore act like we're the one that they answer to for how they're living their life. Let us not do that anymore. But judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. In other words, the man who, let's just play this out a little bit. The person who celebrates Christmas, all right, and they love Christmas, it is encouraged not to put a stumbling block in the way of the person who doesn't celebrate Christmas. What, is, what does that mean? It means that they don't rub it in their face. Why, do you celebrate, why don't you celebrate Christmas? You, are you with me? That's causing a stumbling block. They're, put, they're trying to trip them up. They're trying to belittle what they possibly in faith practice. Or the other way around. The person who sees the celebration of Christmas as some... Uh, they really have dug into it and believe in, in, in some you know, pagan backgrounds or whatever. Whether it's Christmas or Easter or, or whatever. I, I don't know. I, I haven't ever gotten into some of that stuff. But they see that as, man, that's a terrible thing. And if you celebrate it, you're a terrible person. That's putting a stumbling block. Okay? And so Paul's saying, don't do that. They don't answer to you. But don't seek to put a stumbling block in their way. Don't mess with them. Okay? Look at uh, verse 19. What should we do? Okay, verse 17 actually first, because this is, this is good. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. He wants us to do right. He wants us to be right with others. He wants us to be reconciled. He wants us to love each other, honor each other, respect each other. He wants us to have peace. He wants us to have joy. Uh, verse 18, for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved to men. Verse 19, let us therefore follow, instead of judging one another, let us therefore follow after the things. How about this? Pursue the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. So the pursuit of love, we talk about pursuing one another, growing as disciples, growing as a church. We'll know that we are growing as disciples and growing as a church when we find ourselves pursuing things that make for peace, not division. When we find ourselves, when someone else has a difference of opinion or a difference of practice, 
but they're, they're not violating the gospel. And they're not into things, they, they love the saved, and they're not going on a course to ruin their life. And we decide, you know what, they don't answer to me, and I'm going to seek to have peace with them. I'm not going to make a mountain out of a molehill. I think we could all use some of that. I, I know I certainly could. Pursue peace. Look what it says, things wherewith one may edify another. So to pursue one another means I'm going to go after the things where I can build somebody up. I'm not going to tear someone down on a non-essential thing. I'm going to seek to build them up. I shouldn't have a tear-down spirit anyways. Even if someone, say someone is legitimately walking in a direction that they should not go. It's not my place to act like the final judge and, here you go, you're going down. No, my desire should be to lovingly reprove and admonish and exhort and say, hey, are you okay? Are you doing all right? This just doesn't add up. Uh, I've just seen this in your life. I've sensed this attitude. Uh, what, what's going on? And, and you come in like this, and God could use that in their life. That's pursuing, uh, building up. Pursuing peace, okay? Go ahead and turn to Galatians. Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians, wonderful letter by Paul to encourage believers who had, well, really to confront believers who had allowed people to convince them that they needed to add something to their simple faith in Christ. They had believed the gospel, they had repented, they had trusted Christ, they had been saved, but then others came in with another gospel, which was not another because there's one gospel, and started to say, you need to, you need to be circumcised or, or you're not really saved. You're not really, Jesus isn't enough, basically. And Paul said, I, it floors me that you would let them influence you that way. I mean, it blows my mind. The gospel is all you need. And he says in Galatians 5 verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Don't put yourself back in slavery to rules and regulations and of the law, which say you've got to do something to be right with God. That doesn't give you peace in your life. Submit yourself to God. Believe His gospel. Stand fast in the liberty. You have liberty in Christ. You're free. You're free to grow in Christ. You're free to thrive in Him. But notice what he says. Look at verse 14. He says this. Go back to 13 actually. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. In other words... God has set you free with His gospel. He hasn't set you free so you can just do whatever you want. Christ hasn't set you free to say, life's about me. <laughs> and God's not going to judge me. You know, I'm, I'm forgiven and so I can do whatever I want. No, Christ sets you free from yourself and from your sin. He sets you free from religious regulation. He sets you free from all those things so out of a true heart you can be what God designed you to be. You can be like Jesus. You look at verse 14, all the law. Oh, no, 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 back up. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Use liberty to love other people. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But, here's a negative one another. So we have liberty, we're to love, that fulfills the law, to love our neighbor as ourself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. You say, what does that mean? Well, it means, take, or it says, if you're going to eat each other, this must, the Galatians must have been struggling with cannibalism or something. No, there's obviously a word picture here. If you eat each other, you better pay attention that you don't eat each other up. See, when you, when you remove yourself from the gospel, from the life-changing power of the gospel and get off into something, you are more prone to walk in the flesh and be me-centered. And if you're me-centered, you're more prone to bite somebody else. Picture a, a believer here. 
They're just trying to follow Jesus. They're just trying to do the will of Jesus. They love Jesus. He changed their life. Picture a believer here. They've got away from the gospel, from simply believing it and simply trying to live it out and live out that love that they've got. And they, they're, they've suddenly bogged down and, 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 and they're trying to please God, but they're doing it all the wrong way now because they're doing it in the flesh and they're doing it their way. They've removed themselves from the gospel of Jesus' love and Jesus' acceptance and Jesus' redemption. And here they are and they're full of pride and they're full of self and they're walking in the flesh and they look at this believer and they see all their faults and and they just chew them up and and spit them out or a believer picture a believer who is legitimately trying to follow jesus trying to walk in the spirit but we all have days where we're weak and you know someone catches us at the wrong moment now we're like a, a little puppy Snapping at one another, trying to bite. And, and you, you better pay attention because if you don't stand fast in the liberty of Christ and you don't seek to love one another with the power of Christ in you, you will find yourself doing just that. And I will. So we're not to do that. Go ahead and look at verse 26. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Let's not desire things that are empty and that only seek to serve ourself. And, and, and seeking to instigate someone. We know what pushes their buttons. We know what messes with them. And so we're going to provoke them. This isn't talking to pro- provoking one another to love and the good works in Hebrews chapter 10. This is, we know it bothers them if we do X, Y, Z. Or, or we know that some people may be bothered if we don't do something a certain way. And, and so we on, purpose, we on purpose say, I don't care what they think. Now, I'm not saying we've got to always live. Obviously, we can't live to always please everybody. But some people live like they don't even care about anybody. They only desire themselves and vainglory and provoking one another and envying one another. And we're not to do that. Okay, go ahead and go over to Philippians. Philippians. Paul wrote Philippians from a prison cell. And um, go ahead and go to Philippians 2. In chapter 1, I remind you of his prayer of or his prayer for the Philippians, that their love would abound yet more and more in knowledge and all judgment, that they'd have they love each other more and more with common sense, basically. Sometimes we don't do that. Sometimes we make no sense. We just don't think about people. We might say we love somebody, but, but when we don't think about them and what's going on in, in, in their life and thus interact with them and th- with that in mind, we're more prone to lack common sense in our love. Does that make sense? <laughs> you know. Okay, so he was praying that they would abound more and more in knowledge and judgment and love, approve things excellent, be sincere without offense, just be real, don't trip up other people till the day of Christ, be filled with the fruits of righteousness. Look at verse 27 of chapter 1. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. In other words, only let your life be, only live in such a way that fits the gospel. Well, what does that look like? Chapter 2, he says, he told them, fulfill you my joy. In verse 2, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being one, of one accord, of one mind. And here's a negative, one another. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Strife. Let nothing be done. This is a, this is a, a, a 100% word. Let nothing be done. Nothing in our Christian life, nothing in the church should be done through strife. We won't accomplish anything if we are constantly bickering and fighting. Back when the church was voting on a pastor... Uh, in the the vote before uh, the vote before we came, when it was a fifty fifty, nothing was accomplished through strife, but God worked in the hearts of God's people and brought peace and brought concord and brought unity, and we won't get ahead. Listen, if it didn't work then, it won't work going forward. Let nothing be done through strife. Let nothing be done through vainglory. Vainglory again, I'm pursuing myself. It's an empty pursuit. I'm about me. And if, if you approach someone else with, with an idea or a proposition or a complaint or something like that, and it's all about you and, and not about the whole, not about the other person, that's vainglory. Nothing's to be done through vainglory. Um, he says, but in lowliness of mind, watch it, let each esteem other better than themselves. That means they're... You, you look at another person, another believer in this church, and you say, they, they're more important than me. 
their life is more important. They, I see them as more valuable than I see myself. And then he says in verse 4, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Some people are so busy looking at themselves often that you're surprised they don't walk into a wall. We can get that way sometimes, but we're not to look on our own things. Now, we need to take care of ourselves. It's not saying don't take care of yourself, don't take a shower, please. You know, tend to the things of life, right? But our mindset should not be me first. I should be looking on the things of others. How are they doing? What's going on in their life? Uh, How can I be a blessing to them? And, And if we're doing this, watch this, look at a practical thing in verse 14. If we're looking at our own life and at the things in our own life and we're trying to do things to strive for vainglory, then you know what we're going to do? We're going to complain and we're going to argue. But if we're going to value others over ourselves and pay attention to them over ourselves and put them first, if I'm going to put you first, then I am not going to complain or argue. Look at it. Verse 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Now, this group of people right here can set the tone. If, if the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 of us, 16, 17 of us, Andrew, would all determine that everything we do, we are not going to do it in, with a complaining spirit, and we're not going to do it with an argumentative spirit, it would change everything, wouldn't it? It would, it would affect great, a great work of God's grace. In our personal lives, you think about a family with kids, Imagine if kids never complained or argued. We would be driving to Texas instead of flying, right? (laughs) All right? Imagine, imagine, you say, well, that's a perfect world. Well, Christ calls us to, to impossible things, but we can do it if we'll put others first. Do all things without murmuring, without complaining, without disputing. Help, let's help each other. Let's encourage one another. If you hear someone complain about something dumb, um... You know, we were, I'm not going to tell you who it was, but I'm going to give a practical illustration here. We had set up the chairs and tables for the Christmas uh, thing. And it wasn't exactly like it was before. And someone, I guess, had a problem with that and vocalized it publicly. And I was kind and gracious with them, but I, I don't remember what exactly I said. But basically, I tried to say, hey, let's love one another here. It's not a big deal. We have a responsibility, we do as disciples in Jesus Christ, to call one another out lovingly. And if someone's complaining or if someone's seeking to argue, say, hey, that's not how we operate here. We need to value others over ourselves. This is what Christ is calling us to. Okay, go ahead and go to, let's see, where are we, Galatians? No, we're in Philippians. Go ahead and go back to Galatians real quick. I want to show you something real quick. Galatians 6, you know, there's a good chance along the way that we will find other people being or stumbling in their Christian walk. Say someone does stumble and they do a negative one another they're not supposed to do. Say that happens. Well, what do we do with that? Look at chapter 6, verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault... If he's caught up, if he's trapped in it, ye which are spiritual. Well, who are the spiritual ones? Oh, well, that's the pastor. Uh, well, that's the deacons. Uh, well, no. If you go back to Galatians 5, you find that those who are spiritual are those who are standing fast in their liberty and they're loving others. They're walking in the Spirit. They're filled with the fruit of the Spirit. If you're seeking to be a sincere disciple, you are spiritual. If you're feeding your spirit more than your flesh, if you're walking in the spirit, living after the spirit, you're spiritual. And any Christian can do that. Any Christian can do that. So if a man be overtaken in a fall, you which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. In other words, say, you come along to him and you help him correct that. Restore such an one. From what I understand of the Greek word, it has to do with the resetting of a bone. 
When someone gets off in their Christian life, it's like they've broken something in their Christian life. If, if they're prone to a complaining spirit or if they're prone to lust or whatever it is that you come across, a brother or sister, they're tripped up, they're overtaken in a fault, something in their life has broken, you're to come alongside them and restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. And he says, look at it, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You're, you're to approach them with humility and say, I noticed this, I heard you say this, did you really mean that? I mean, is everything okay in your heart? I mean, can, can I help you? And ask the Lord for wisdom to help them, encourage them. And look at this, verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You say, this disciple thing, and this fellowship thing, and this discipleship thing, and this admonishing one another, this sounds like a burden. It sounds like a burden to care about another person. Yes, it is. And Christ bore your burden all the way to Calvary. And if we are going to obey Christ and obey his law for us, then we are going to bear one another's burdens. Go back to Philippians 2, and I'll land the plane here. How is this, how is this all possible? or What should be our motivation? Look at Philippians 2, verse 5. You want to live the gospel. It's got to be your mindset. Jesus has to be your mindset. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus did not believe he was taking anything away from God as God's son. He, was, he saw himself as equal with God. But what did he do? Made himself of no reputation. He became a n- nobody from Nazareth. N- Nazareth. It was... I don't know. I don't know the name of a town around here. You think of a town with a stereotype... Maybe think of places in Atlanta like the Spoon or East Point, and you're like, oh, man, what good thing could come out of there? That was Nazareth. That was Jesus. He was born. He was raised, born in Bethlehem, but raised in Nazareth. He was a Nazarene. No reputation. A carpenter's son. I mean, what? Made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. The God who created everything was made in, in the likeness of men. He became a man. How weak and frail are we? You ever just think about how much of a doofus? <laughs> I, I do. This is me, okay? So sometimes I think about how much of a doofus I am and how very little I truly understand and how I don't always measure up as a husband, as a father, how even basic life things. I mean, I spill coffee all the time. I'm a klutz often. I'm frail. I'm a man. And one day I'm going to die. Could be today. Could be in 50 years. But one day I'm going to die. And all the earthly things I ever amassed, somebody else will get. And I'm going to turn to dust in a box. This body will turn to dust in a box. I am flesh and blood. I, 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 what am I compared to Jesus Christ who created everything and who holds it all together by his power? And yet he became a man. And you look in verse 8 and being found in fashion as a man, what did he do as a man? Did he just... Live it up. He humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He obeyed God's will and died. And if you and I are going to live out these one another's, if we're going to pursue one another in love as his church, as disciples, that means you and I obey God and die at Calvary. Just like Jesus. That's our mindset. That's our prayer. Today, I'm dead. Ben Springer doesn't exist anymore. What Ben Springer wants, what Ben Springer desires, it doesn't exist. And Christ lives in me. And look what that did for Jesus. Because of his obedience unto death, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus was obedient even unto death, and then God exalted him to the highest place. And if we follow in his footsteps, he promises us disciples. He promises us great reward. He promises us great glory. The way up, as one would say, is down. We often think, well, I got to, I got to, I got to. And that's how we live. That's how I live. And yet, if we're going to follow Jesus, we're going to be a disciple of Jesus, 
I'm dead. And whatever you want today, however you want me to treat my wife today, however you want me to treat my kids today, however you want me to treat my church today, whoever you want me to talk to you about today, however you want me to treat whoever today, that's what I'm going to do. I don't belong to me. Christ lives in 